O God of heaven, it is good to sing your praises, to worship you together as your people, with our lips to give articulation to the song of our hearts. You are stable, you are a rock, you are reliable, you do not change. Your throne is an anchor, a fortress. You hold all of time in your hands and you know us. What a grace it is to be known by you, to know you, to be loved by you, and to love you in return. All of these grace gifts we extol you for this morning. We worship you as your creatures who ought to worship you because we were made. And we worship you as the redeemed because you have saved us. Poured out your love on us who were unlovely. Who were by nature your enemies. Oh God, thank you. We come now this morning to your word. To a section of your word we might not gravitate to. We might not choose to read or or preach, but you have revealed that we pray that you would use your word to its intended effect in our hearts this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of this morning's message from Revelation chapter 8 is four trumpets and an eagle. Sounds like the beginning of some joke or maybe a concert of a brass quartet and Glenn Fry. It's not a joke, what we will read this morning. It is not some musical interlude. This is documented history of our planet's future. Look down at your Bibles and read with me what God says will happen. Verse 6 introduces the seven trumpet judgments this way. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And the first sounded And there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the creatures which were in the sea, those which had life, died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded. And a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and night in the same way. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. This section of scripture is not a metaphor for political movements. It's not a symbol of religious ideology or the rise of false teaching. This is not a series of allegories of past historical events. These are real happenings. This depicts a series of ecological catastrophes of increasing effect that will wreck the planet and dismantle hope for all who live on it. Our world is concerned about ecological disasters, oil spills, mining disasters, chemical waste, core meltdowns at nuclear power plants. 
And we work hard to try to avoid them. We recycle, we invent cleaner products, cleaner processes, cleaner fuels, we reduce waste. As a child, I was taught not to break styrofoam. Maybe you were taught this. It was irrelevant by the time I had styrofoam in my hands, but early versions of styrofoam were actually produced with the infusion of chlorofluorocarbons. And to break styrofoam was apparently to release those CFCs into the atmosphere. And those CFCs made their way up to the ozone layer, that protective barrier in our atmosphere that was going to keep the earth from being scorched by the sun. And, and there was a hole in the ozone layer over the polar regions. And the more that I would break styrofoam, I was taught, uh, the greater the hole in the ozone layer would become. I didn't want us all to die. I didn't want the sun to zap fry the earth's population, so I dutifully ceased from breaking styrofoam into pieces, as fun as it was. Because as far as I was concerned, I was not going to be the cause of global incineration. I also was taught as a kid to cut with scissors those plastic six-ring holders because they were, of course, the demise of the bottlenose dolphins. And if I cut the six-pack rings before throwing them in the garbage, I personally would save bottlenose dolphins. What happens in the end times is a series of God's judgments against earth's inhabitants. What is this passage all about? As we see these end times judgments against earth's inhabitants continue, God sends four ecological catastrophes followed by the ominous pronouncement of a flying eagle. That is the main thesis of the sermon this morning. I do not expect you to memorize that. Our outline is very simple, four trumpets and an eagle. The four trumpets detail those first four judgments of God in a series of trumpet judgments. And these first four are ecological disasters that God will bring upon the earth. And they are outlined by these four trumpets. Let's look at the first one. In verse 7, we read the following. The first trumpet sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Hail and fire coming down from the sky are reminiscent of the seventh plague on the nation of Egypt during the Exodus. You may remember that God brought a series of ten plague judgments on the nation of Egypt in order to force Pharaoh, the Egyptian monarch, to let his slave labor population, the Israelites, escape. We read in Exodus chapter 9, Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field, throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and Yahweh sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. And Yahweh rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field throughout all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. You see, a hailstorm with fire has happened before, a very literal one. You may have been in a a hailstorm, And depending on the size of the hailstones, you could have been injured. This one will be awful. The Egyptian storm of hail and fire was regional. It was even precisely selective. We read in Exodus 9.26 that the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were, was spared completely from this plague. But this storm of the first trumpet judgment in Revelation 8 is not regional, it is global. Not just the land of Egypt, this affects every region on every continent. Notice all the green grass was burned up. That is, the hail and the firestorm descends on every landmass on the earth. But there's an added horrifying element to this storm. 
blood. The sight of blood by itself is sickening and terrifying. It is a sign of something gone terribly wrong. And in this disastrous storm, there is blood everywhere. Hail and fire in this verse are said to be mixed with blood or mingled with blood. It it could be that blood is spilt as the result of hail striking humans and animals. But it seems more grammatically likely that the description points to blood mixed with the hail and fire descending to the earth from heaven. Hail and fire and blood don't normally mix. They don't naturally mix. Our tendency when we read these judgments may be to come up with some natural explanation for the events. This is phenomenological language and and John is describing what he sees, but it can't really be what it is. I don't think that's the right approach. These are not natural disasters. They are supernatural judgments from God. We should, in fact, expect such miraculous wonders at the close of man's day on the earth. This is the day of the Lord. There will have been no day like it before. God, of course, has enacted supernatural wonders on the earth before. Ex nihilo creation, everything being spoken into existence out of nothing is a miraculous wonder. The global flood may have used natural and physical means to accomplish God's judgment, but no doubt that was God's enforcement of judgment on the earth. God came down to crush the Tower of Babel. He rained fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, and He brought the ten plagues on Egypt. All of these things were miraculous wonders experienced by men on the earth. They were real, historical, unique events that do not fit the normal and predictable and explainable features of the world as we experience it today. And we're easily attempted to assess the accurate record of these future events by our own experience. And frankly, we have a very narrow window of experience to draw on. You and I have not lived long in this earth. We weren't here for those miraculous wonders of days gone by. And so maybe we sit in judgment of the Bible's record. That stuff can't be true. I've never seen it before. No one has. These will be unique. And rather than us sitting in judgment of God's word, the reality is that humanity will be judged when these things take place. And so descending from the sky is a massive hailstorm. It destroys plant life, it strips the trees, it smashes structures, it pelts people and animals. And with the hail comes fire. Notice in our text that one third of the earth is burned up. A third of the trees are burned up and all of the grass is burned up. If you followed the story of the Lahaina fire, you you may recall that 3.39 square miles of Maui were scorched in that awful tragedy. The island of Maui is 727 square miles. A third of Maui would be 242 square miles or 71 and a half times the size of the Lahaina fire. Another way to think about the proportions of one third of the earth burnt in this judgment is to consider the two top wildfires in recorded human history. Uh, The top one is a 2003 Siberian taiga fire in Russia that consumed 55 million acres. And number two on the list, you may recall in 2020, the Australian bushfires that covered 42 million acres. That's a total of 97 million acres or 151,000 square miles and change. Earth's land mass on 196,900,000 square miles would make those largest wildfires combined less than one thirteen hundredth of the earth. Here in this judgment, a third of the earth is burned up. That is 65,633,300 and change square miles of earth's land mass scorched. 433 times the size of the most devastating wildfires the world has ever seen. And with this hail and fire comes blood, blood raining down from the sky, mixed with the hail and the fire, blood everywhere. The stench and the gore will be horrifying to those who dwell on the earth. This will be an ecological disaster, the likes of which the world has not seen. 
There is an Old Testament expectation that the Egyptian wonders would be reproduced at some level. Listen to Jeremiah 23. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when they will no longer say, as Yahweh lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt. But they will say, as Yahweh lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I had driven them, and then they will live on their own soil. Ezekiel 38 says this, With pestilence and with blood I will enter into judgment, and I will rain a torrential rain with hailstones and fire and brimstone. I will magnify myself. I will set myself apart. I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am Yahweh. This trumpet judgment details a supernatural ecological disaster that is designed by God to punish a rebellious world and to make it very clear that the owner of the earth is Yahweh, the one true God, to whom all are accountable. After the first trumpet judgment, we hear a second trumpet sound, verses 8 and 9. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea, those that had life, died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The way this text reads, these four trumpet judgments occur in rapid succession. We get the impression that the earth dwellers have no time to catch their breath. When the hail, fire, and blood storm stops, a second angel blasts a trumpet and a burning chunk collides with the earth. This is a second world impacting ecological devastation. Notice the text reads something like a great mountain. It's not a mountain, but it's like a mountain. And this something like a mountain is thrown Some giant hunk of rock, all ablaze, hurtles toward the earth and crashes into the sea. Perhaps some sort of meteor that violently hits the ocean. The sound would be deafening. The effects would be devastating. The sea here, I believe, is the collective oceans. It seems to hit in one spot, but in such a way that affects the globe. We read that a third of the world's ships are wrecked probably by the mass of tsunamis created by the impact. You can imagine that two-thirds of the ships may ride it out. Open ocean swells might be safer than ships at harbor pummeled by towering breakers. But a third of the sea-going or ocean-going vessels will be destroyed. Such waves would, of course, devastate coastlands and inundate islands. But notice in verses 8 and 9, A third of the sea became blood. And he doesn't say like blood. Notice it was something like a mountain thrown down into the sea, but here he very carefully points out the sea became blood. And a third of the sea creatures died. This is not a metaphor. This is not a symbol. This is not a figure of speech. Like a mountain is a figure of speech, a simile. But turn to blood is not. And you might be thinking, meteors don't normally turn seawater to blood. And you'd be correct. Again, this is not a natural occurrence. An explanation in phenomenal, I can't even say the word, language that paints a picture. The oceans looked like blood because the sun refracting off of the smoke from the impact obscured and made a haze to turn the waters into a reddish hue. That would be like blood. That's not what the text tells us. This is miraculous, supernatural, end times judgment designed to punish a rebellious world and to make known the one true God. And this literally happened in history in Egypt in the first plague in Exodus 7. Moses lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants and all the water that was in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish that were in the Nile died, the Nile became foul, so the Egyptians could not drink the water from the Nile, and blood was through all the land of Egypt. This historical event was so memorable that Israel put it in their songbook. 
Listen to Psalm 105, 29. And you might imagine humming a tune to these words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Or Psalm 78, 44. He turned their rivers to blood and their streams they could not drink. Here in the second judgment, it is a third of the salt water on the earth turned to blood. You can imagine the stench. You can imagine the death. Uncountable ecosystems destroyed. And if the judgments ended here, if this was the last ecological disaster, if it all came to an end, but earth continued on, how long would it take our planet to recover just from what has happened so far? Would it ever recover? You recognize that half of the earth's oxygen is produced by the phytoplankton in the earth's oceans. The world needs it. The chain reaction of the destruction of food chains from the bottom up would have immeasurable effects on all of the earth's systems from then on. Why do we see these one-thirds in these judgments? It's important to recognize that these judgments are still merely partial. This is not the full outpouring of the wrath of God. We'll find out under the bowl judgments that the entire oceans will be turned to blood later on. This is God's restraint and it is worse than anything the world has seen, but it is not as bad as it will get. At the end of this judgment, with likely no time to recover, the earth experiences a third ecological disaster. Trumpet number three depicts a, the crashing waves having subsided. M maybe the explanations begin, well, how is all this happening? And all of a sudden, the atmosphere is broken up by a falling star. Look down at verse 10. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers, and the third, and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. We read in verse 10 that a great star fell. Star is a word to use to describe a light source in space aside from the sun and the moon. So planets, stars, comets, meteors, they're all referred to as stars. We even do this in English. Uh, a falling star is a, a meteor, and if it makes it through the atmosphere and hits the earth, it's a meteorite. And this one fell. Remember in verse 8, the giant blazing hunk was thrown it gives the appearance of a greater velocity and probably a different angle. The, the thing coming fast at the earth like a giant mountain on fire hits the earth directly. But in verse 10, this object is said to fall. When we talk about a falling star, we're, we're talking about a cosmic piece of dust that's going through our earth's atmosphere and burning up as it goes. We call it a falling star as it streaks across the sky. I think that's the picture here. It, it travels across the sky burning like a torch. Its slower descent means that it probably intersects Earth's atmosphere more tangentially than that rock hitting directly. Burning like a torch reflects the Greek word lamp. It makes its way across the sky burning like a great light that all can see. And this falling star seems to break up in the atmosphere because it falls not in one spot, like the rock in verse 8, but it falls on a third of the rivers, and it falls on the springs of water. This judgment is a contamination of fresh water on the world's land masses. It makes the drinking water undrinkable. Verse 11 tells us the water was made bitter. And so pieces of a comet or a meteor striking all over the earth that bear some toxic chemical that contaminates the groundwater. It may be something like the groundwater contamination after the Chernobyl disaster, or maybe from the heavy metals that leaked out of that Gold King mine in Colorado in 2015. Or perhaps this is some sort of supernatural toxicity. According to our text, the star is named. It's named Wormwood. The Greek here is absinthe. It's a bitter herb that grows in the Middle East. Artemisia absinthium. It produces a bitter taste, is toxic in large quantities, 
has been used historically as medicine in small amounts, and it has been used to produce an alcoholic beverage. In the Old Testament, bitter drink was often a metaphor for judgment. Let them have gall to drink. This toxic water is not a metaphor, it is literal. It's the opposite of the miracle that happened during Israel's desert wandering at the place called Mara. Mara means bitter. When the stick touched the bitter waters, the waters were made sweet or drinkable for the people, according to Exodus 15. And here the opposite happens. This bitter herb, this plant-like thing, touches the waters of the earth and everything becomes undrinkable that it touches. The text tells us that many died from the waters. We have a third of the waters embittered, but not of the third of the people die. Many die. We're not told what proportion. Can you imagine the worldwide panic? Do you remember Costco during COVID? The run on bottled water was immense. Can you imagine violence and bloodshed at any source of drinkable water? It would become more valuable than all of the world's most precious commodities. In this plague, there seemed to be no time for recovery plans, for UN solutions, for the elite humanitarians of the world to gather at Davos for compassionate solutions to the world's problems. On the heels of the contamination of fresh waters, we encounter a fourth terrifying ecological nightmare. Lights out. Here's the fourth trumpet, verse 12. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. The grammar in the original language helps us understand the nature of this darkness. John is precise here in describing not dimness, but duration. It's not that the sun is partially obscured so that it shines at two-thirds strength. Uh, no, rather, for a third of its time, it is black. It is gone. The moon and the stars, likewise. This is not about the, the, the amount of light being emitted. This is about the duration of light being emitted. The light of the sun will be seen on the earth for a third of its normal time during the day. And the light of the moon and the stars will be seen on the earth for a third of their normal time at night. If you can imagine the solar equinox, it happens twice a year, uh, March and September. That's when the time of day and time of night are equal because the sun is traveling across the equator, speaking from an earth dweller's perspective. And imagine during that time if the sun switched off for four hours during the day. Imagine for four hours during the nighttime all the stellar dots and the moon blinked out for four hours. We're not told how many days this goes on, how long this judgment will last. We do find out later in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, that the sun will scorch men on the earth. They won't repent, they'll curse God. And it could be that these two judgments are simultaneous. What an interesting time to live on the earth, where there is no benefit from the sun's warming rays. The sun scorches when it's out and, and then disappears altogether. This will be terrifying. It will be without precedent. It will be without scientific explanation. And you and I have grown familiar with how long a day is. We know when the sun rises and when it sets. You can look at it on your phone. You can pull up tables of times of when this happens. You, you can find out when the autumnal and vernal equinoxes have been for as long as there's been history. We know these things, we're comfortable with these things, and we know them and feel like we're sort of in charge of these things. All of this will be upended. Men's confidence in everything will be shaken. This is a supernatural wonder of God's judgment on the earth. 
And we thought that LA's rolling brownouts were a disruption of the power grid and a major inconvenience. This will affect every area of life around the globe. The Old Testament prophets told us that the day of the Lord will be characterized by darkness. Listen to Isaiah chapter 13. Behold, the day of Yahweh is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the earth a desolation. He will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Amos 5 says this, Will not the day of Yahweh be darkness instead of light, gloom with no brightness in it? Amos 8 and 9 says, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord Yahweh, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. This is reminiscent of the ninth plague in Egypt. You remember that localized, just in Egypt, there was for three hours thick darkness, according to Exodus 10. Jesus promised this reality. Listen to Luke 21. Jesus said, There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What ensues on the earth is a series of judgments that bring about increasing devastation. Just like in Egypt, one plague after another with increasing severity. And the earth dwellers during the tribulation will be like little pharaohs, hardening their hearts against God, rather than repent and experience mercy. One has cleverly said, the whole world is in Egypt and every man a pharaoh. Think about this one-third, one-third, one-third again. This is, this is God's judgment in restraint. The fire that comes down out of heaven is a preview of eternal torments in fire that will take place in the eternal state for all who do not believe. The darkness that the world experiences is a preview of that outer darkness of eternal punishment. There is more judgment to come, both in the tribulation, but also in the next life for all who will not believe the gospel. Think about the darkness that came over the land at the crucifixion for three hours. And I don't know whether the darkness was localized to the Middle East to the area of Judea and Jerusalem where our Lord was killed. I don't know if that darkness covered the whole earth. But it was a supernatural declaration by God that what was happening at the cross was awful, serious. You think about what happened there that God Himself and the person of Jesus Christ had come to earth, to His earth. The world He made and the world He sustains by the word of His power. To the creatures that He created and gave life to and breath. To His creatures to whom He gave the sun and the rain and the breezes and the seasons indiscriminate, lavish provision on a world of rebels. And he came to the earth to reveal himself and to teach us and to live as an example and to heal and to save. But primarily he came to the earth to die. To die a death on a cross to be strung up between heaven and earth, between God and man as a mediator between us sinners and the holy justice of His Father. And in so doing, hanging in midair, He became a curse. 
He took upon himself the sins of every sinner who would ever believe in him. And he clothed himself in our iniquities. So that when his father looked down on him and saw all of that sin, sin that was not his own, but the sins of the ones he came to love, his father looking down on all of that sin poured out wrath. The wrath that flows out of divine justice, out of holy goodness, out of love of what is excellent and pure and good. A love that must punish recalcitrant sin. And Jesus bore in his body our sins against God. And the darkness enveloped the land and the wrath of God was poured out in full for all who believe. So that for everyone who is in Christ, the entirety of the wrath of God against those sins is drawn in, absorbed, and extinguished forever. For those who do not know Christ, that wrath has nowhere to go except on the heads of those who don't believe. And it will come. It is that wrath that we see in these trumpet judgments. It is only partial in these judgments. The fullness of that wrath will come in the unfolding of God's judgment against the earth dwellers. But then in a final bodily resurrection to a great white throne where every deed will be judged. Every heart will be assessed. Every stray thought will be held accountable. And justice will be done. Friends, you have to know that justice must go somewhere. And justice can come to you personally if you do not repent. Or justice can go to Jesus Christ as your substitute if you will believe. After the first four trumpets are sounded, we see in Revelation chapter 8, in verse 13, an eagle. John records, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. Mid-heaven just refers to a high point in the sky where the sun would be seen to stand at midday at its zenith. Why do eagles soar? Of course, it's a photo op for us. That's why they're there. Why do eagles float on thermals and wind currents high in the air? What are they doing there? It's dinner time for the eagle. It's bad news for a fish or a rabbit, or the carcass of some beast of the forest. An eagle is an ominous sign. It's hunting. This is a bad omen. Bad things are about to happen on the ground. And this eagle soars high in the sky so that he can be visible to the earth dwellers and audible. This eagle intends to be heard. This eagle speaks And you know that Edgar Allan Poe made a raven speak. That was a literary device. Satan took on the form of a serpent and spoke. It was Satan's words. They were lies and murder. And you know that the false prophet Balaam, forced to speak truths, also witnessed the speaking of his own donkey. That donkey was God's spokesman. Here, an eagle soaring above the earth dwellers becomes God's spokesman once again. And what does he say? Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the last three trumpets. These last three trumpet judgments are called woes. We'll see them unfold in the text. A first woe, a second woe, a third woe. They are trumpets five, six, and seven in this series of judgments. This is a warning of impending doom. 
And there's a difference between the first four trumpets and the last three, just as we saw a difference between the first four seal judgments and the last three. Those first four seals were set off as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, followed by a triad. Here we have the first four trumpet judgments are ecological disasters. They affect men indirectly. They are, they are cataclysms on the earth. But the last three judgments of the trumpet judgments are judgments against, of God against humanity directly. And that's consistent with the scriptural use of the word woe. It is a warning of impending doom against people. What does all this text do for us? I hope it makes you flee to Christ. I hope it makes you as a Christian an evangelist I trust that it dislodges any impression for you as a believer that this world is some sort of permanent home. Listen, no one will be able to save the trees. You can chain yourself to a redwood if you want. No one will be able to save the oceans or the whales or the delta smelt or any other endangered creature. Every creature on the earth will be endangered during this time. Humanity's residence has been on the earth. This has been our house. It's been a gift and a stewardship. It's a good place in many ways. But man has failed in his relationship to this earth. God's design was a design of stewardship. But sin messes everything up. Listen, we pollute it or we worship it. This is man's sin. God's design for humanity was a loving, selfless lordship over the creation, a responsible governance for the glory of God. And in God's kindness, His common grace, He has provided rain and sun and seasons and the provision of food and goodness. Again, these things are indiscriminately lavished on a world of people who do not acknowledge the giver. They don't recognize that this is His, and they don't give thanks. God's kindness obligates gratitude. We must give thanks for the painted skies of an Arizona sunset, for the warming rays of the sun and the cooling breezes and the changes of weather. We must give thanks to God for the hydrological cycle where God evaporates seawater, purifies it for us, and dumps it on the land masses as that which is drinkable, replenishes the earth, grows our crops, cools our air. He gives glaciers and snowpack that store that water accumulation in solid form, saves it for summertime. We have drinkable water year-round because of God's brilliant design. The ocean's plankton provide us oxygen to breathe and the base of the food chain that sustains all of life on earth. God gave sea life for us to look at and eat. He gave us the moon and the stars for signs, for seasons, for beauty, for a math problem for Abraham. Can you count the stars? So will your descendants be. God gave the stars for us, and I believe in our day, telescopes to get an understanding of size. So that when we see the broad scope of the universe and how far away these distant bodies of light are, and we go back to Isaiah and we read that God measures it by the span and holds it all in the palm of his hand. We get a sense of the bigness of God. These things are for signs and seasons to, to point us to God and his goodness. During the tribulation, they will become signs for judgment. God gave us trees and green grasses. I love the color green. 
I stood at the ocean yesterday and I marveled at the vastness of it. It's big and blue and deep. The ocean gives us a sense of the size of God and the smallness of man. Behind me were green hills and snow-capped mountains. You think, where were you, New Zealand? No, trust me, Southern California looks like that, like one week out of the year, and I was there. All of these good gifts will turn to bad omens of judgment. Justice come due. For you tree huggers and whale savers and California condor taggers, for all of you environmentalists here this morning, you need to know that there is something right about taking good care of God's creation. There is something fundamentally wrong with pollution. Trash in the rivers, trash in the ocean, a discarded beer can on a hiking trail. Listen, Revelation eleven eighteen says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. The earth groans under the sins of humanity. But listen, the failure of proper environmental stewardship is not fixed by idolatry. To worship the created thing rather than the creator. To value animals and plants higher than humanity is actually sin. Mother Nature is an idolatrous notion. This is my father's world. It belongs to him. And those that belong to him ought to reflect his priorities. The world's priorities are these. Listen to Romans 1. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor give thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. The result of man's disposition of ingratitude and a failure of worship of the maker of things will result in the earth turning on man. This world, because of humanity's sins, is headed for a series of unstoppable ecological disasters. Greenpeace can't stop global warming. Global warming is real and inevitable, but will not come by the hand of man, not directly. It will be the judgment of God against man that brings global warming. And listen, for those of you who know Christ, you know this world is not our home. We are made for another place. Our home is with Him. We look to that better home by faith, Hebrews 11. We recognize Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship, where we belong, the value system of our politics is heaven. To those who live on the earth now, the message of Revelation is clear. Your house is on fire. And what do you do when your house is on fire? Well, of course, you remodel the entertainment room, right? You, you, you buy new lazy boys and you make sure they have good cup holders and, and you get a bigger screen and, and better surround sound. But the whole house is coming down. The message of this text is get out. Where do you go? Where do you flee? What hope is there for this world? Well, friends, the hope is the gospel. What hope is there for any of us? Our only hope is Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning again looking at a, a passage of Scripture that is frightening in its scope. It stretches our imaginations, it's 
too awful to contemplate for long. And yet you have put this in your word. Why, O oh God, is this here? So that we would read it. So that we would feel the impact of these things. So that we would have a recalibrated sense of justice and rightness. That we would grieve over our sins and run to Christ. He is our only hope. I pray for everyone in this room that they would indeed flee the wrath to come and find joy and life and refuge in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.